Um, I remember, you know, some of some of our boots. Those are new guys. We call them boots. W would ask me like how how I was keeping my spirits up throughout the war. You know, when everybody else was either freaked out or you know like worried about the outcome, what would happen, worried about getting uh, shot or blown up or whatever it was. And they would say, Corporal Courier, how are you, you know, like so positive? And, you know, and I said, don't you see all these cameras around? There weren't any cameras, of course, but I would always tell them they're, they're filming a Hollywood movie right now and you, you're in charge of picking your character. I mean, you get to dictate that. And I knew the character I wanted to play, you know, and I was enjoying it. I didn't enjoy all the things that I had to do along the way, but as far as like a, a character and a leader and a role model, I knew what I wanted to be, and I knew how I wanted to serve my country. I, w I wanted to do it with respect and pride. Back when I was 18 years old, I, I had probably seen the movie Full Metal Jacket about a thousand times. I had every line of the movie memorized, and my dad was a Marine, so, um, you know, I, I think it was just, it was inevitable I was gonna end up becoming a Marine, and I. You know, I graduated boot camp in uh, October, and a year later, September 11th happened. Right after September 11th, we went on our first deployment immediately. Uh, we we're assisting and helping out with the, the beginning of what, what would become Operation Enduring Freedom. I had been dating a girl for seven years, and while I was over there, she had sent me ring sizers and wanted to start planning the wedding for when I got home. You know, I, I picked the one that fit my, my finger, I sent it home to her, and I just, you know, smiled when I put it in the mail, let her do her thing, you know, to plan a wedding. It had already been seven years. I had been dating the girl since I was 15 years old, since right when I turned 15. She was my first everything, you know. Um, I love the girl to death. And uh, March 19th, 2003, I was sitting on the border just waiting and waiting and waiting. We finally got the call, and uh, we invaded Iraq on March 19th, 2003. My unit was, we were called the tip of the spear, first light armor reconnaissance battalion. We pushed north, I think it was about 600 kilometers from Kuwait all the way through to uh, Tikrit, engaged in every city along the way. We were in at least a firefight almost every single day. I had this gut feeling. Nothing would shake it. I couldn't stay away from the news. It was on 24-7 when they had the embed reporters, and he was the first unit in, so I got to watch it. I thought something bad was going to happen, and when it didn't, and they we got noticed that he was the their unit was coming back to base. They weren't allowed to leave, though. So I went and, you know, I made a big banner and welcomed him with everybody else, and they had kind of a parade, and a, um, they, they had so many stories and so much emotion, and... You know, it was, it was really cool to see how the country embraced us. You know, we were, we were heroes in, in uh, San Diego and in Southern California when we came back. You know, they, they said after the fourth day that we'd be able to go home and see our families. And on the third night, a friend of mine had asked me to drive him down to San Diego I said that that was fine because he didn't have a vehicle as long as he drove home and it had to be up early in the morning. So when we got to San Diego, um, I fell asleep in the in the truck and just waited for him. He got back in the truck, drove back to base, and right at the uh, entrance of, of the, the base where the gate is, the road curves to the left and uh, he had fallen asleep at the wheel and just kept driving straight. We were doing about 80 miles an hour or so when he had fallen asleep with his foot on the gas hit a tree and then we ended up rolling down a hill about a dozen times and on a Camp Pendleton. Um, I woke up, uh, my head was turned around backwards, my face was, had been kind of caved in and my lungs collapsed and I knew something was really wrong. I, I didn't know what had happened. I was really confused and my lungs were collapsed, so I only had about 60 seconds of time to breathe. I, over those 60 seconds, the breaths just got shorter and shorter and shorter. It's weird because I don't feel like I, I, I'm somebody who quits anything, but in the end, I, I almost feel like I had given up. You know, that last breath that I took, I knew, you know, and I just, I, I made peace with it right there. I mean, they got so short, it was just like, you know, and I, I knew that one of those was the last one.
And then uh, I woke up five days later in a hospital. I heard my brother's guitar playing and I heard him singing in my hospital room. And I came out of the, uh, the coma and um, they told me right away that I had broken my neck in the accident and I was paralyzed from the neck down. And at first, you know, it wasn't even a big deal to me when they told me. Because right when I got the news, it was like, well, I can overcome anything. You know, I'll, I'll, they might say that I'll never walk out of here, but give me a month and I'll be, I'll be running again. The doctors told me that wasn't going to happen, and I, I always thought they were wrong. And, you know, I think after about the first year, 18 months, I finally, you know, like it started clicking that they, they knew more than I did about the severity of my accident and that I was never going to walk out of the hospital or, or get out of this wheelchair. I, it couldn't be, because I already made sure. I flew out there, I touched him, I stayed with him in his barracks for three days. I knew he was okay. They already had to operate, they didn't know if he was even gonna survive, he broke his neck. I just, I didn't believe her, I, I, it couldn't be, because I already did my job, I already made sure, and I hung up on her. I said, no. No, it's not my son, uh -uh. So right when I got home from the hospital, um, I got to see my family and I got to see Maureen. You know, in the next week she had started moving her stuff in with me and she called me and I was already in bed and um, I was just, you know, like barely awake. And she said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm going to be working late. Um, and I said, I'm actually in bed already, so go ahead and work late and I'll, uh, I'll just see you whenever you get home. And I woke up the next morning and my bed was empty. It, she wasn't there. And right away I knew something was wrong and then my phone rang and I couldn't answer my phone. I knew when my phone was ringing and it was a number that I didn't recognize that something had really, something was wrong. And I heard my mom come down the hall and answer the phone in the kitchen. I heard her say hello, I heard silence for a, a minute, and then I heard the phone fall and hit the floor, and then I heard my mom fall and hit the floor. And when I heard that, and I heard the tears start, you know, I, I, I knew right away, you know, and she, she had passed away in the accident. And that's when everything just came crashing down. You know, the reality set in. I started feeling really s sorry for myself. I, you know, like I, I would cry looking in the mirror. I couldn't even stand looking in the mirror and seeing myself sitting 90 degrees. I was such an active person and, you know, my physical fitness was such a big part of my life. I went through a long period of time where I couldn't even say a single word. Like, my vocal cords wouldn't work. I couldn't even say the word, okay. So I just started hiding, you know? I hung out in my room a lot. Um, a couple of close friends would come over and they would get drunk with me, you know? And it started off drinking a lot and um, turned into drinking all the time. You know, I was, I was always drunk. And I was also taking a bunch of meds that the VA was uh, giving me. And then it turned into, um, you know, some street drugs. I'd gotten a rifle and I was ready. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't have any desire to live anymore. Um, it had gone on for so long, and I, I still wasn't able to climb out of a hole. I wasn't even trying to climb out of a hole. So I started learning, you know, even though my hands don't work, I, and this new rifle, the, the charging handle on it was a little tight, so it was hard for me to figure out how to pull it back. And I remember I would sit at the end of my bed, I would mount the rifle between my legs, upside down and I would push the charging handle back with both hands, you know, on my palms. And I finally got it. You know, it was it was so heavy, it was so hard for me to do. And I turned the rifle back around and I leaned over it and I put my, my thumb on the trigger and that started becoming a nightly occurrence. I left the charging handle back and every night I would pull it back out and I would lean over it and I would put it in my mouth and I got really familiar with the taste of that barrel. I would taste that salty barrel, and I say it was salty because it was covered in tears, you know, every night. And, um, but it would make me wake up the next day. And it was like, just one more wake up, just one more wake up. And I say that to anybody else who's ever struggling. It's like, you, you just need to get 
get to bed and wake up again. You're at your bottom right now. If you have a barrel in your mouth or if you're considering those things, you're at the bottom. And there's only one place to go from there if you don't follow through with the action and it's back up. A friend of mine knew where I was at. Um, a friend of mine saw the rifle on my bed. A friend of mine, you know, like there were situations where guys were starting to realize um, we, we need to do something with them. And one of my friends kept telling me about adaptive sports. And he would tell me stuff like, you need to come to this event in Colorado and go skiing with me. I say, dude, I'm a quadriplegic. I'm not going skiing, you know, it doesn't even make sense. And then he showed me some of the equipment that they used and how you sit down in it and somebody's behind you tethering you, you know, like if you can't stop or turn or anything. So after two years of telling him no, I finally said yes. Now, this is when everything changed in my life because against, you know, everything that I wanted to do, I went out to Aspen, Colorado. I got on a ski lift with a couple of instructors and we went halfway up the mountain and then they asked me if I wanted to get on the other lift right next to it and go all the way to the top. So we went all the way to the top, I get off the lift, we turn around and we're facing forward and I'm looking out at what seemed to, you know, in my vision be the entire planet. I remember when my instructors got behind me and they were like gonna scoot me to the edge of the hill so we could start the run and I asked them to hold on for a minute, you know, because I just wanted to take it in. I was at the pinnacle of, you know, the highest point um, that I'd probably ever even been at um, in my life. And I was doing it as a quadriplegic and I knew what I was about to face going down. It was about to be a challenge. I was about to feel adrenaline again. I was about to like find that piece of me that I had felt like had been missing for so long. Everything for me changed in that moment. It was very motivating. So now the next chapter starts. You know, that, this is the beginning of the next chapter. You know, all of a sudden, there was this goal that I didn't even really have, but I had just met, you know? Getting out of my comfort zone gave me the confidence to think like, heck, if I can do this, I may as well, you know, like, it just set this, this thing in motion. So I started going back to school, and then I signed up for the National Veteran Wheelchair Games. And when I went to the National Veteran Wheelchair Games, I met a whole new group of peers a lot of them in very similar situations, a lot of quadriplegics and a lot of paraplegics. All these new friends that I met, I asked them all if I would see them again at the next event. You know, I, I was hooked at that point. And everybody had the same response. It was always, well, if I can afford it. And I'm thinking, you know, that was like a light bulb went off. I was like, wait a second. So you would be at all these adaptive sports and so would I if we could afford them. Well, let's do something about that. You know, like, I don't know what the solution is exactly, but with all of our powers combined, we can, we can fix this, right? Um, so like 50 of us in a hotel lobby just started brainstorming some stuff. And uh, we're like, well, we'll start a nonprofit that keeps people on the move. Oscar Mike, on the move, right? The name just, it, it just was immediate. Oscar Mike was a term that we use in Iraq all the time that told people, when, you, when somebody said, I need you to get Oscar Mike, you didn't even think. There was no hesitation, you just started moving. You knew that they either needed help or you needed to get that, you know, you needed to get somewhere fast. That was, that was it. Let's get people moving. Let's shorten that period of time like me that was a half a dozen years. Let's make that shorter. When it came time to, to saying, well, who's going to do this? You know, <laughs> our, yeah, the idea is there. We're all agreeing on it, but who's going to do it? All I, I remember saying, well, I got a two-car garage. You know, we can use that. And then three other guys all said, I'll, I can come out to Illinois for six months probably. And I got three guys to come out to Illinois for six months, rent a house and um, right next to mine and help me start Oscar Mike in a two car garage. We, we contacted an attorney to help us file for a nonprofit, a 501c3. He helped us file it that day, but he also said that it could take up to two years to get approved. And, you know, that was a little disheartening to all of us. So we asked if we could also file for a business there so we could start doing something. We could start raising money. And he said, yeah, we can file a business today. You guys can start right now. So we did that and we filed for an LLC and we started Oscar Mike Apparel. So Oscar Mike Apparel helps fund the nonprofit, the Oscar Mike Foundation. And, you know, it, it's the reason that we get to do what we do. It keeps us on the move.
So the Oscar Mike Foundation is a nonprofit that helps injured veterans get involved in adaptive sports. And we fund a lot of what we do through Oscar Mike Apparel, which is an apparel company. Now, Oscar Mike is bringing the veteran service organization community together through apparel, even though we still have our nonprofit. So we're helping injured veterans get involved in adaptive sports, and we're bringing the community together through our apparel. Initially, when I was hurt, I was in a huge, dark place I didn't think I would be able to get out of. At one point, I, I contemplated, you know, ending it all. But then I thought about who I would leave behind, and I just, I just couldn't do it. So after I got through that stage, I looked at myself and didn't want to be uh, bedridden and having all my family friends baby me and, and call me. I met, met Tim Bixay at the National Rugby Team's clinic three years ago. That's how I found out about Oscar Mike, and I've been with him since. In my old unit, our motto was uh, uh, deeds, not words. And I live by that even today. Show me something, I don't want to hear about it. Where I'm sitting right now, where we're, where we're shooting this, um, this room, this glorious room right here, um, is in the Oscar Mike compound. It's our first facility, very large home, seven bedrooms, five bathrooms, and the purpose of us having this is to rehabilitate veterans, and maybe not even rehabilitate them, maybe some of them have already been injured for a long time, but to give them a place that they feel like they're at home, they're a part of the family, they're breaking bread with us, they're training, they're kicking each other's butts, they're heckling each other all day long, and the, the community grows stronger and stronger and stronger, right? That's the purpose of this facility. And even though we just opened it, it's already working, it's magic. But this is a template, you know, this is, this is number one. So today we are here, we've got three of our athletes that are competing in a, an adapted triathlon. What our athletes are going to be doing, uh, they're going to be paddling in a kayak or paddling their bodies. Uh, one of our athletes has chosen to swim across. Um, they're going to make one complete lap around the lake, which is roughly five miles. And then once they finish that, they're going to transition across the lake here. And then from that location, they are going to run or uh, one of our athletes has chosen to push in a wheelchair rugby chair. Uh, one of our rugby players is here and is going to do that with him. So we're looking for them to be able to adapt and uh, move efficiently through the water on the land in whatever their event is that they're competing in. Today I will be on my stand-up paddleboard to assist Jonathan Lopez. Um, he uh, opted to do the swim portion um, as he's training for an open water swim. So I'll be paddleboarding next to him just to supervise and make sure he's feeling okay throughout the whole course, um, as well as making sure that the kayakers are safe out there. Um, some of the athletes that will get on a weekly basis may or may not do physical activities like this on a daily or weekly basis. So it's kind of testing that out, seeing their capabilities and kind of challenging them to see how far they can go. Come on. Almost home. Let's go. Good. Go. Good. I got fangs. Woo! The other day, I was driving home from work, and it, it was, you know, it was a busy morning. I had, I went to the hospital. I stopped by and saw you guys at the clinic. I went to work. Um, I stayed to work at work late, and I, I started. When I'm my drive home, I was by myself and I got some windshield time and I was like, um, I just started like smiling, you know, even though I was really stressed out at the time. And I realized why I was so happy is because I was on my way here and I wasn't going home, I was coming here and I knew who was here. And the thought of that was so cool to me 
And the entire time from when I started Oscar Mike, um, I always felt guilty when people would ask me about the start of it. And they were asking it like, oh, you started this, you know? They were interviewing me as like a founder. I'm like, well, wait a second. <laughs> Before I go taking all the credit, this was an idea at the National Veteran Wheelchair Games. You know, this was something that spawned out of the, uh, the necessity for this. You know, to keep guys on the move, to keep them lost for Mike. It, it means the world to me. I, I love every single one of you, and I'm extremely grateful for all of you. Thanks, Noah! I can love Continue it! You know, like when we started this thing in a garage with, you know, a hundred dollars, I really never thought guys would end up getting tattoos that say Oscar Mike on them or our logo on their bodies. We had to have our stuff out there. We had to have people believing in it. But I think people use Oscar Mike as like an alarm clock almost. When you don't want to get out of bed in the morning, you think about it. And you think that if you use the term Oscar Mike or you think about, heck, if you're an able-bodied person, let's say, if you've never been injured, you know, you're. You're having a rough day, your alarm clock's going off, you're like, I'd rather sleep in. Maybe I was out drinking last night, who knows what your excuse is. Everybody has excuses when their alarm goes off. But you start thinking about us and all the injured veterans that you see through all of our stuff. You think about how hard of a time they have. And I think people recognize that. You know, they, people aren't dumb. They know that we're, we're struggling through a lot of things and we're doing it without complaining. That's why I say it's like an alarm clock to people. When they can use us as inspiration and motivation, you know, it, it's, it makes it a little bit easier to get out of bed when that thing starts ringing. When you're out running, you know, even if it's a mile, um, you're not thinking about anything else. You're thinking about finishing that mile. You're thinking about finishing it faster than you did the last time. You're breathing in this fresh air in an intense way. The endorphins are going up. It is like meditating in a way, working out, being physically active. And then you start beating goals. And goals are so important for every human being. You know, it leads to the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. Oscar Mike is like, it, it's encouragement for people to just keep, keep crushing their goals. <laughs>